Hello, and welcome back to Infinite Jeff, but a kind of a special bonus edition of Infinite Jeff today. We're breaking the format a little bit, just because, uh, <clears throat> so out of curiosity, I went back and listened to the first installment of Infinite Jeff, just because I kind of just hadn't, didn't remember what I'd said. Um, so, and, but I, and I was like... Uh, the forward, I'm gonna skip the forward, because I don't care. And I didn't, and I don't, uh, but, so, what I'm gonna do now is read the forward, the entirety of the forward, actually, which is about four pages. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, more like, uh, six pages? Six and, yeah, five and a half pages. But, we're gonna, we're gonna do it, because, uh, I, now that I've read a little bit into the book, I'm curious as to what the forward says, so... I'm gonna do that. I'm throwing up as a little bonus, just cause, just cause. It's my my book, my project. I can do whatever the fuck I want, and uh, you can sit back and like it. So this is the forward of Infinite Jest on Infinite Jeff. Forward. <clears throat> In recent years, there have been a few literary dust-ups. How insane is it that such a thing exists in a world at war? About readability in contemporary fiction. In essence, there are some people who feel that fiction should be easy to read, that it's a popular medium that should communicate a somewhat, on a somewhat conversational wavelength. On the other hand, there are those who feel that fiction can be challenging, generally and thematically, and even on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis, that it's okay if a person needs to work a bit while reading, for the rewards can be that much greater when one's mind has been exercised and thus, presumably, expanded. Much in the way that would-be civilized debates are polarized by extreme thinkers on either side, this debate has been made to seem like an either-or proposition, that the world has room for only one kind of fiction, and that the other kind should be banned and its proponents hunted down and, why not, dismembered. But while the polarizers have been going at it, there has existed a silent legion of readers, perhaps the majority of readers of literary fiction, who don't mind a little of both. They believe, though not too vocally, that so-called difficult books can exist next to, can even rub binding suggestively with, more welcoming fiction. These readers might actually read both kinds of fictions themselves, sometimes in the same week. There might even be though it's impossible to prove, readers who find it possible to enjoy Thomas Pynchon on one day and Elmore Leonard the next, or even readers who can have fun with Jonathan Franzen in the morning while wrestling with William Gaddis at night. David Foster Wallace has long straddled the worlds of difficult and not as difficult, with most readers agreeing that his essays are easier to read than his fiction, and his journalism most accessible of all. But while much of his work is challenging, his tone, in whatever form he's exploring, is rigorously unpretentious. A Wallace reader gets the impression of being in a room with just a very talkative and brilliant uncle or cousin who, just when he's about to push it too far, to try out our patience with too much detail, has the good sense to throw in a good lowbrow joke. Wallace, like many other writers who could otherwise be otherwise considered too smart for their own good, Bellow comes to mind, is, like Bellow, always aware of the reader, of the idea that books are essentially meant to entertain, and so almost unerringly balances his prose to suit. This had been Wallace's hallmark for years before this book, of course. He was already known as a very smart and challenging and funny and preternaturally gifted writer when Infinite Jest was released in 1996, and thereafter his reputation included all of the adjectives mentioned just now, and also this one. Holy shit. No, that isn't an adjective in the strictest sense, but you get the idea. The book is 1,079 pages long, and there is not one lazy sentence. The book is drum-tight and relentlessly smart, and though it does not wear its heart on its sleeve, it's deeply felt and incredibly moving. That it was written in three years by a writer under 35 is very painful to think about, so let's not think about that. The point is that it's for all these... Reasons, acclaimed, daunting, not lazy, drum tight. Very funny, we didn't mention that yet, but yes, that you picked this book. 
Now, the question is this. Will you actually read it? In commissioning this forward, the publisher wants a very brief and breezy essay that might convince a new reader of Infinite Jest that this book is approachable, effortless even, a barrel of monkey's worth of fun to read. Well, it's easy to agree with the former, more difficult to advocate the latter. The book is approachable, yes, because it doesn't include complex scientific or historical content, nor does it require any particular expertise or erudition. As verbose as it is, as, and as long as it is, it never wants to punish you for some knowledge you lack, nor does it want to send you to the dictionary every few pages. That's... that... N n mm. I... Uh, I don't know. I do go to the dictionary every few pages, I would say. And yet, while it uses a familiar enough vocabulary, make no mistake that Infinite Jest is something other. That it... That is, it bears little resemblance to anything before it, and comparisons to anything since are desperate and hollow. It appeared in 1996, Sue Generis, Sui Generis? How do you pronounce that? Sui Generis. Sui Generis. Sui Generis. Sui Generis. Sui Generis. Sui generis. It appeared in 1996, sui generis, as I've stated many times, very different from virtually anything before it. It defied categoriz categorization and thwarted efforts to take it apart and explain it. It's possible, with most contemporary novels, for astute readers, if they are wont, to break it down into its parts, to take it apart as one would a car or Ikea shelving unit. That is, let's say a reader is a sort of mechanic. And let's say this particular reader mechanic has worked on lots of books, and after a few hundred contemporary novels, the man mechanic feels like he can take apart just about any book and put it back together again. That is, the mechanic recognizes the components of modern fiction and can say, for example, I've seen this part before, so I know why it's there and what it does. And this one too, I recognize it. This part connects to this and performs this function. This one usually goes here and does that. All of this is familiar enough. That's no knock on the contemporary fiction that is recognizable and breakdownable. That it, this includes about 98% of fiction we love, know, and love. But this is not possible with Infinite Jest. This book is like a spaceship with no recognizable components, no rivets or bolts, no entry points, no way to take it apart. It is very shiny, and it has no discernible flaws. If you could somehow smash it into smaller pieces, there would certainly be no way to put it back together again. It simply is. Page by page, line by line, it is probably, probably the strangest, most distinctive, and most involved work of fiction by an American in the last 20 years. At no time while reading Infinite Jest are you unaware that this is a work of complete obsession, of a stretching of the mind of a young writer to the point of, we assume, near madness. Which isn't to say it's madness in the way that Burroughs or even Fred Exley used a type of madness with which to create. Exley, like many writers of his generation, and the few before it, drank to excess, and Burroughs ingested every controlled substance he could buy or borrow. But Wallace is a different sort of madman, one in full control of his tools, one who, instead of teetering on the edge of this precipice or that, of this precipice or that, under the influence of drugs or alcohol, seems to be heading ever inward, into the depths of memory, and the relentless conjuring of a certain time and place in a way that evokes. It seems so wrong to type this name, but, then again, so right. Marcel Proust. There is this... Proust? Proust? How do you say that? Well, I don't know how to say it. Sorry. Proust, Proust, Proust. It's French. Prist. Uh -huh. Anyway, 
there is the same sort of obsessiveness, the same incredible precision and focus, and the same sense that the writer wanted, and arguably succeeds at, nailing the consciousness of an age. Let's talk about age, the more pedestrian meaning of the word. It's to be expected that the average age of the new infinite jest reader would be about 25. There are certainly many collegians among you. Collegians? Okay. Probably. And there may be an equal number of 30-year-olds or 50-year-olds who have, for whatever reason, reached a point in their lives where they have determined themselves finally ready to tackle the book, which this or that friend has urged upon them. It's like they're looking into my soul. The point is that the average age is appropriate enough. I was 25 myself when I first read it. I had known it was coming for about a year because the publisher, Little Brown, had been very clever about building anticipation for it, with monthly postcards bearing teasing phrases and hints sent to every media outlet in the country. When the book was finally released, I started in on it almost immediately. And thus I spent a month of my young life. I did little else. And I can't say it was always a barrel of monkeys. It was occasionally trying. It demands your full attention. It can't be read at a crowded cafe or with a child on one's lap. It was frustrating that the footnotes were at the end of the book rather than on the bottom of the page, as they had been in Wallace's essays in journalism. And you don't, you don't even get the footnotes till the end. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm totally fucking with you on this because I just say footnote whatever. And then at the end of the book, like on page, for instance... One thousand fifty-four. I'll just say two ninety-five, whatever it is. Two ninety-six. Da 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 da. Two ninety-seven. <laughs> so that'll be fun. So I'm even like, it says you can't read it at a doc. Can you read it one page at a time, one day at a time? Put it up on the internet, the YouTube's for everybody to hear. Can you read it like that, Mister Forward Writer Guy? <sighs> Uh, there were times reading a very exhaustive account of a tennis match, say, when I thought, well, okay, I like tennis as much as the next guy, next guy, but enough already. And yet the time spent in this book, in this, I, I've said that exact same shit, I was just talking about it, just enough with the tattoos, enough with the, enough with the, enough with the, <sighs> Basic patch. And yet the time spent in this book, in this world of language, is absolutely rewarded. When you exit these pages after a month of reading, you are a better person. It's insane, but also hard to deny. Your brain is stronger because it's been given a month-long workout. Or, alternatively, a nearly three-year-long workout. Just think about that. And more importantly, your heart is sturdier, for there, there has scarcely been a written, written a more moving account of desperation, depression, addiction, generational stasis and yearning, or the obsession with human expectations, <clears throat> with artistic and athletic and in intellectual possibility. The themes here are big, and the emotions, mm -hmm. guarded as they are, are very real. And the cumulative of effect of this book is, you could say, seismic. It would be very unlikely that you would find a reader who, after finishing this book, would shrug and say, eh. Here's a question once posed to me by a large baseball cap-wearing English major at a medium-sized Western college. Is it our duty to read Infinite Jest? Uh, I would say yes. This is a good question, and one that many people, particularly literary-minded literary people, ask themselves. The answer is, maybe. Sort of. Probably, in some way. If we think it's our duty to read this book, it's because we're interested in genius. We're interested in an epic writerly ambition. We're fascinated with what can be made by a person with enough time and focus and caffeine and, in Wallace's case, chewing tobacco. Oh, yum. 
If we are drawn to infinite gist, we're also drawn to the magnetic fields as 69 songs, for which Stephen Merritt wrote that many songs, all of them about love, which, by the way, it's called 69 Love Songs. Let me just double check, because I have it. Yeah, 69 Love Songs. It's right here on my shelf. Uh, for which Stephen Mayer wrote that many songs, all of them about love, in about two years, and were drawn to the 10,000 paintings of folk artist Howard Finister, or the work of Sufia... Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> or the work of Sufian Stevens, who is on a mission to create an album about each state in the Union. He is currently at state number two, but if he reaches his goal, he will approach what Wallace did with the book in your hands. That's hilarious to me, because... Okay, so first of all, the first Sufjan Stevens album that was about every state in the Union was called Greetings... Well, it was, in, it was just called Michigan, but this, the album cover says Greetings from Michigan, the Great Lakes state. I'm from Michigan. It mentions places that I've lived in and been to, like, so that's cool. Like, it's, he's not from Michigan, but he wrote an album about Michigan, and it's good. Like, it's good indie rock stuff. Um, it was recommended to me by a friend from high school. Yeah, she wasn't a friend in high school, but, well, I don't know. She worked at the music store, and, and I saw her years later, and, uh, yeah. But, uh, then the second one was called Come On, Feel, Feel, Feel the Illinois, and then he didn't do any more, so this was written... Judging by that, this forward is in about 2004, I would say. Um, but then he announced it was all just a joke. It was just something he said to fuck with people. Like, he did the two state albums, but that was it. He never intended to do all 50. So that's really funny that um, this forward, Mr. Forward Man uses uh, that as a, uh, you know... Uh, you know, similar to uh, what Wallace was doing with uh, Infinite Jest when he wrote that. So, that's funny. But anyway, the point is that if we are interested in human possibility and we are able to cheer each other on to leaps in science and athletics and art and thought, we must admire the work that our peers have managed to create. We have an obligation to ourselves, chiefly, to see what a brain, and particularly a brain like our own, that is, using the same effluvium we, too, swim through, is capable of. It's why we watch Shoah, or visit the unending scroll on which Jack Kerouac wrote in A Fever of Days on the Road, or William T. Volman's 3300-page Rising Up and Rising Down, or Michael Aptid's 7-Up, 28-Up, 42-Up series of films, or, well, the list goes on. And now, unfortunately, we're back to the impression that this book is daunting. Which it isn't, really. It's long, but there are, very ple there are pleasures everywhere. There's humor everywhere. There's also a very quiet, but very sturdy and constant tragic undercurrent that concerns a people who are completely lost. Who are lost within their families, and lost within their nation, and lost within their time. And who only want some sort of direction, or purpose, or sense of community, or love. Which is, after all, and conveniently enough for the end of this introduction, what an author is seeking when he seeks to write out a book, sets to write out a book. Any book, but particularly a book like this. A book that gives so much, any, uh, that requires, required such sacrifice and dedication. Who would do such a thing if not for want of connection, and thus of love? Last thing. In attempting per to persuade you to buy this book, or check it out of your library, it's useful to tell you that the author is a normal person. Dave Wallace, and he is commonly known as such, keeps big sloppy dogs and has never dressed them in taffeta or made them wear raincoats. He has complained often about sweating too much when he gives public readings, so much so that he wears a bandana to keep the perspiration from soaking the pages below him, and there it is. There it is. He was once a nationally ranked tennis player, oh, that makes sense, and he cares about a good government. He is from the Midwest, East Central Illinois to be specific, which is an intensely normal part of the country, 
not far, in fact, from a city, no joke, named Normal. So he's normal and regular and ordinary, and this is his extraordinary and irregular and not normal achievement. A thing that will outlast him and you and me, but he will help future people understand us, how we felt, how we lived, what we gave to each other, and why. Dave Eggers, September 2006. That Yeah, that makes more sense, because... Maybe it was 05. Anyway, that was the introduction of uh, Infinite Jest in this particular edition by uh, the foreword, I should say, by uh, da Mr. David Eggers, whoever that is. Who's David Eggers? Uh, he is a writer, editor, publisher, married to Vanilla, but I saw some kind of writer. Okay. Kind of looks like a... Yeah, whatever. Yeah, so that was the introduction, or the foreword, to uh, this particular edition of Infinite Jest on Infinite Jeff. I hope you had as much fun as I did going on this journey with me and enjoying this bonus, mini bonus ode of Infinite Jeff. Good night.